The B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. That's probably the least interesting intro I've ever had. Is anybody else cold in here? Do you guys mind if, I, I'm gonna put on a sweatshirt real quick. If you guys can mute the mic maybe. You can't get this from EFF. I was uh, thinking I was going to sweat having to wear this thing through the talk. I'm actually glad I have it now. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeff Mann. I uh, uh, hope you're not here to learn a whole lot today. I don't feel like I'm going to be teaching as much as just kind of sharing stories of my past. If you're into history, this is really more of a history lesson. Um, you might find some interest in it, and certainly if you have questions, feel free to shout them out, or hopefully we'll have some time towards the end to uh, discuss a, a little bit. Um, if you're interested, that's what I used to look like about 20, 25 years ago, um, back when I was young and more nimble. Uh, my contact information there. Uh, I'm not working for any company right now. I'm currently unaffiliated, so if any, any of you are hiring, uh, Feel free to approach me afterwards. A um, little bit about me and how this talk came about. I was, I was, I think it was at a B-Sides earlier this year, and somebody was giving a talk on the history of crypto, and I'm, and I'm an ex-crippy, so I'm always interested in that. So I went to the talk, and as I'm sitting there listening, I, it occurred to me, gee, I could give this talk. So that's how this talk came about. Um, I've been doing information security for over 30 years. Uh, first uh, third of that time, uh, approximately, was at uh, NSA. I did some work at, for the DOD as well uh, before I went to, the, to NSA. Been out in the private sector for uh, a little over 20 years. And uh, for better or for worse, for about half that time, I got involved in PCI. Uh, so you can love me or hate me. but. It wasn't my fault. It was purgatory maybe, but I'm out of it now. Um, if I look familiar, if any of you guys watch Paul's Security Weekly, I'm sometimes a host on that uh, show. In fact, I think I'll be heading up there this week. I uh, don't know who we're talking to yet, but uh, it's usually a good time. I, I, and I'm, I'm one of the honorary curmudgeons uh, that gets to be on Security Weekly. And I'm also a Jedi master. Uh, talk I've been giving a lot this year has been on the art of the Jedi mind trick, which is really about how to communicate. You know, we know a lot about security. We know a lot about how networks and systems work and how to break them. Um, but we as a community don't always do a good job communicating that to others. So as a consultant for 20 years, I think I've learned some techniques. So uh, I did a conference earlier this year where I actually had a stormtrooper escort, which was kind of cool which is the highlight of my speaking career, and the two sticks is probably the other side of that. No offense, guys. Um, so a really, really brief history of cryptography, codes, and ciphers. Uh, I am technically trained as what's called a manual cryptanalyst, paper systems. Um, some of these concepts should look familiar to you because they apply forward today to modern cryptography and, and, and really what we've come to know as cybersecurity. Um, the idea of you're trying to protect some sort of information, some sort of data that you want to keep secret. Uh, classically, there's three different things that you, three different goals for uh, using cryptography. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Using codes and ciphers is primarily the confidential things, at least historically. Um, there's two ta classic types of uh, crypto systems, a code and a cipher. Uh, in modern times these days, these terms are sort of used interchangeably. But historically, uh, codes were a method of basically shortening a message, uh, maybe by using some sort of a symbol or some sort of a, a word that means 
a phrase or a, a sentence or something like that, but generally speaking, a code was uh, some sort of method of shortening a message, making it short and quick, so that you could get the message through to the other person quicker, more easily, more simply, less likelihood of uh, losing it in translation or losing it in, 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 in transit, and, uh, and also keeping it secret. Ciphers are what we're more familiar with. That's some sort of uh, application of cryptography, encryption. There's two types of ciphers, transposition and substitution. Transposition means you're taking what's there and just scrambling it. Uh, substitution is where you're applying some sort of different alphabet, some sort of different uh, set of characters. Usually, uh, that's where you start thinking of algorithms and keys. Uh, what I used to do for a living, uh, the way you broke cryptography historically, uh, there's several different methods, but the, the very first thing you would do it typically is take whatever scrambled message you had and just start doing counts. You know, if it was scrambled letters, just start counting the letters and see how many of them there are. If they were symbols, you'd, you'd try to look for symbols. You'd also try to look for patterns. Um, People much smarter than me over the years, uh, I, have, uh, I have a few show and tell items you guys can come up afterwards and see. Um, these books, Military Cryptanalytics, part one and two, they used to be classified. Uh, they are no longer classified. They have the official magic marker scratching out the, conf the confidential classification. They really are declassified. These books are full of frequency analysis information, everything you could possibly think of about how to break systems. Uh, volume one is mostly manual. Volume two actually gets into machine cryptography a little bit. Feel free to come up and, and peruse these later after the talk, as time allows. Um, you find out what's there, and you start looking for patterns. You start looking for telltale signs. Um, uh, just a very simple example, the, in English, as you're writing down English language, there are frequencies of letters. Certain letters are used more than others. And this is a, a, um, a graph of the typical usage of the English language and the frequencies of letters in the English language. Um, you know, for example, the letter E is the most common letter used in the English language. You can imagine letters like Q and K and J are used less frequently. So when it comes to a transposition system, uh, again, you're just taking what's there and scrambling it around. Anybody know what m movie that was from? Very good. You passed the first quiz. Um, Whereas a substitution system is you're taking the letters and uh, you know, most people have heard of a Caesar cipher, a rotation of the alphabet against itself. Substituting the regular letters for a, a different letter using various methods of how do you determine what slide you're using and you can even scramble up. There's lots of, lots of applications of that. But basically the, the, the Caesar cipher was something that was actually used in the Civil War and that's an actual uh, Confederate cipher wheel or cipher disk, they called it. You've probably seen uh, puzzles, and you know, those of you who are old enough to remember newspapers, um, you know, the funny pages used to have the little crypto puzzles and crypto quizzes and things like that. These are all simple substitution systems. So if you're doing counts of the letters, trying to figure out how many letters are there, or if you're looking for patterns, you know, like the one on the right, you can see the, 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 the size of the word is preserved and, and the separation of words is preserved. Well, that's a big clue when you're a cryptanalyst because there's only so many one-letter words in the English language, assuming that's the language that you're going after. Two-letter words, there's only so many of them. You can start noticing uh, different letter combinations and things like that. But most importantly, you need to realize that with a simple substitution, while you're scrambling the letters, you're preserving uh, the frequency range. It's just in a different order. So, you know, if, if this was the statistical analysis of some cipher that I was looking at, and that's the, the, the graph on the right, you know, I would start out by guessing, gee, it looks like the letter Y is substituted for the letter E. Let me fill that in everywhere there's a Y. Let me write in E, and let me see if that helps me detect any patterns of words and things like that where I can guess the next letter, and so on and so forth. And at some point, you get enough letters, you can start figuring out what alphabet or what slide's been used. 
sometimes it's trial and error, there's different methods to do it. Um, but that's essentially what cryptography was for many hundreds of years. Um, what takes it to the next level then is when you start introducing uh, some sort of random stream of characters to add to your message, primarily to try to disguise the characteristics that carried over. And this is where we start talking about having a key involved. The thing that I used to work with uh, in, you know, in my early days of learning about cryptography and working in this field, uh, I learned, and it's still true today, the thing called the one-time pad is the most perfect crypto system around. It cannot be broken statistically, any type of analysis, any kind of frequency checks. It's unbreakable as long as you're using this random stream of characters, the key, one time and one time only. Uh, it absolutely falls apart if you think, well, it's, it, it worked once okay, I can use it again and again and again. That actually creates cryptographic vulnerabilities where it can be broken. But if you use it only once, it's unbreakable. And that's sometimes a hard concept for us to think about in, in terms of modern cryptography where it's all about key sizes and key lengths and, and really what's it take comp with computation, with you know, computer power to brute force a system. But there is no brute forcing a one-time pad. Uh, the algorithm, as it were, is very commonly, and this is one that I used to use all the time, um, this happens to be called a vignette. Vignette was, I guess, some French mathematician. I always said visionaire because I'm an ugly American, but if you're French, it's visionaire. Um, but it's basically the alphabet reversed in 26 different offsets written out in a complete table. What this gives you then is the ability to, you know, it doesn't really matter you know, whether it's uh, row or column, but find your, your plain text, your message letter, on one, you know, down one side, if you will. Um, boy, can I use the laser thing? There we go. Say your, your plain text letter is down one side, your key's down the middle, you line it up and find a third letter, and that is basically the cipher, the message, the code that you'll send on. And I think I have an example here. So a one-time pad literally was a pad of paper, uh, think like a notepad or a, a, a you know, a sticky pad notes. It was typically sealed on all four sides with one corner left uh, unglued so you could peel up a page at a time because it was very important to use it one time only. So if you had a message that you wanted to encrypt, you would write it out letter by letter. Um, so, gosh, that's really far away. I'm going to read it from here. Enemy sighted on border, stop. Stop is like Morse code for period end of the sentence. Uh, attack at dawn, stop. And then a, a string of characters like X's just to let you know that the message over, you can stop. If you're on the other side decrypting, you can stop now. So you, you use that visionaire square as a technique to find the third letters of your cipher. You write them out, and that's the message that you send. Now you notice I didn't start with the first, uh, uh, what's called an octet. Uh, I'm sorry, not octet. But the first five characters uh, wasn't used, that's your, that's your code for which page to use if you're on the receiving end. You look at the first characters and you find the page that matches. Hopefully it's the one on the, you know, the top page. But you know, messages could be sent multiple times and conceivably be received in different order. So if you're on the receiving end, you have to check that. So if you do that, you've got your own copy of the one-time pad. There's usually two in existence for you know, end-to-end -end communications. You write down your message, and you simply reverse the process, and you get back to the plain text message. That's how one-time pads work. The beauty of one-time pads from a cryptographic, from an analysis perspective, is you're taking the characteristics of the, of, of the underlying plain text, and you're eliminating it. There are no spikes there now that really stick out, and there really is no way to guess letter for letter, because any letter will work. It'll always go back to something. You can actually potentially decrypt this message to anything you want it to say because it works that way. There is no way to get the one right answer. So that's a little bit of background. That's the kind of stuff that I was involved with. So uh, some tales about my time at NSA. Uh, chapter one. I started out uh, 
in the end of 1986, so about th 30 years ago, working for what was called the Manual Crypto Systems branch within the defensive side of the house, which was called Inf Information Security or InfoSec. Um, they hired me uh, and, and decided to train me to be a crypt analyst because they were going through a review of all the paper systems that they had deployed over the years. Uh, oh, and in case you didn't know it, NSA provided and provides all the crypto systems for the DOD, for the military, uh, and, and most of the government if you're dealing with classified information. Uh, certain mail servers possibly accepted. Um, so in the early days, I did cryptography. That's the NSA building there. Um, to put things in context, I started at the end of 1986. Anybody know what that is? It is the Enigma machine. Um, when I started working at NSA, it was still considered a secret that the U.S. and the, you know, the, and, and the U.K. and its allies had broken the cryptography of that system. Anybody want to guess why? It was still being used. In fact, it was still being used, I think I should look this up and actually have the answer. 88, 89 is when it, when it stopped being used. It was being used by certain countries that maybe were considered adversarial to the US and its allies. And as long as it was still being used, it was a secret that we knew how to break the messages. One of the very first jobs I did um, in this office was associated with the paper systems, but the paper systems had been kind of neglected because from like the, the, the late 60s or mid, you know, the, the Vietnam era, if you will, uh, things like machine cryptography started becoming popular. Uh, is anybody a veteran? Some of you might recognize some of these devices. Um, and I'm sorry if it brings back painful memories because I know these things were painful to use. Um, Gosh, I gotta look at this. <laughs> I might have a picture of that, or I might have opted out. Um, this is actually one of the early versions of an encrypted phone. And it was actually a couple different devices, starting with the phone, which was kind of like a walkie-talkie. It had a little clicker on the side that you pushed to talk, and then you had to release to listen. That's, that's called half duplex. It's one-way communication. So you can't be talking at the same time. You have to talk, stop, wait for the other person to respond. And it was attached to a separate piece of equipment that was doing uh, encryption of the signal um, using, and that's what we considered machine cryptography. This is a device that actually took analog, took a voice and converted it to digital and, and then did the encryption. So on the other end, the, the, the device would take the digital, sig digital signal, decrypt it, convert it back to an analog signal and you'd hear the voice again. Um, you can imagine, this is Vietnam War era. Um, if anybody, anybody want to admit to having used it, how did it sound? Uh huh. Yeah, you, you would sound the voice. All the voices you couldn't get, you couldn't really tell who you were talking to because it, it, it all sounded like Donald Duck. It was very kind of muted and crackly and just wah, wah, wah. Uh, and it didn't improve with other technology that used later on. This is the radio, the Syncgar's uh, radio, which is really the, just the phone set. Um, all these devices had to have key. They had to have keying information, and that keying information was. Uh, generated in these systems and the little thing sticking out at the top was sort of like the key loader that you, you would fill it with key and then plug it into these different devices and load the key or inject the key. So this was stuff that was happening sort of all around me. I was working on the paper systems that were ignored and neglected because everybody was using this and they just assumed that paper was going away. Um, just as a real quick note, anybody know who this guy is? Oliver North. Why do I have him in my talk? Uh, anybody here ever a ComSec, a Cody, com, ComSec a custodian? Yes. This talk is for you, I guess. Um, 
ComStat Custodian, all this keying information, all these key equipments, the one-time pads, the paper, all this kind of stuff had to be distributed securely. Two-person control, signing off on everything. Obviously, the security of a one-time pad relies on the fact that nobody steals it or copies it. So it has to have absolute total control, eyes on it, everybody's keeping it locked up. Two people are, are trans, uh, you know, signing for it. And this was all done by something called a ComSec account. So my office was responsible for the ComSec account that would ship all the paper out and, and different systems to different customers, if you will. Well, my, I, you know, as the new member of the office, I guess I got stuck with being the ComSec custodian, the one that was the keeper of this account. And my account happened to be the one that was used, it was before my time, to uh, send crypto equipment out to Ollie North, this guy from the White House that called and said, I need all these devices that he then used to do the stuff that he did. Um, so that's like my little you know, uh, connection to Ollie North for better or for worse. But you know, all the crypto gear, it had to be signed out, the one-time pads, the paper systems, and another type of paper system called an authentication system. All that kind of stuff had to be shipped out through the ComSec account. Um, the, the, the more modern version of crypto that I was familiar with when I started there was something called the Stu3 telephone. So the key was actually that little key device on the side. Um, stuck it in, turned it, it would load the key and you could use the phone in a secure manner and you still sounded like Donald Duck. Um, still half duplex, I think there were three different models. One I think was full duplex, I forget which one it was, but it was, it was revolutionary because NSA made the design and then shipped it out to, to private contractors to actually build the devices. So Motorola had one, I want to say RCA had one, and GE was the third, I think. And I think GE was the one that was uh, full duplex. So you could actually listen and hear inflections and get, you know, talk back and forth. Anyway. Um, I had a customer very, very early on when I started in, in, in this office that came to me and the customer happened to be people that do the, the, the spooky kind of stuff uh, for the DOD. And they said, uh, you know, we're using one-time pads, we're talking to people that are our friends and people that we're talking to that are in places where it's very important to keep it secret that they're talking to us and we have to communicate with one-time pads, but we've got this new thing sitting on our desk. And is there any way we can use this to speed up the process? Because sometimes it would take them hours to do that encryption and decryption manually of the one-time pad messages. So I thought, well, gee, that makes sense. Why not use it? So I developed and became a project manager for what, to my knowledge, is the first software-based crypto system that was ever produced by NSA. And all we did was write a program that would do this algorithm, this encryption decryption process, wrote it into a program. I want to say it was Turbo Pascal. Does anybody remember Turbo Pascal? And uh, it was, and, and the magic of it was we took the one time pad and put it on a floppy disk. And we had to emulate a page of key. We had to emulate the method of doing the encryption and the decryption. And most importantly, we had to emulate the secure destruction of the page when it was done. It actually had to be erased or deleted off the, off the floppy disk so that it couldn't be accidentally reused. Um, I had to follow specs that were written for hardware. I think there was a slide earlier, I, I didn't point it out, but I had a chief scientist that worked in my organization at the time. I heard him say, you know, there's really no such thing as software, there's only hardware. NSA built little boxes, you've seen pictures of them, that did this crypto stuff, and you would plug things like phones and radios into it, and magic would happen, and the signal would come out the other end, and the reverse process would happen. So I had to write software design specs, uh, essentially, that modeled what we were supposed to follow, um, but from the perspective of software. And, and this system would totally not work today in, an, in our networked world, but back then, the, the desktops were standalones, and uh, so there was, and it was in a it was in a locked room, a protected area, and so it was relatively safe to use for the people that were using it. So, the what we called the semi-automated one-time pad, half floppy disk and half paper. It became so popular that I had another customer, who happened to be U.S. Special Forces. They were involved in a process similar. 
uh, where they had communications where they relied on one-time pads and they, and they would talk to, to their deployed teams, their A-teams out in the field via one-time pads. And instead of on their end uh, using one-time pads, they had actually one-time tapes. And these tapes, which were produced by NSA that emulated the one-time pad, which was in the field, were run, in, were run in a series of machines, similar to the one in the middle there, that would take it and convert it. And so you would type a message into a machine that would produce a tape, and you'd have to feed that tape and the key tape into another machine that would do the algorithm and combine it. That output was then converted to uh, an artificial language voice and was recorded on reel-to-reel -reel tape and sent to another machine, slapped on, and then it was broadcast over entire hemispheres of the world. And um, I couldn't find a picture of the base station that they'd been using, but they had one that was basically, uh, took the entire uh, back of a, uh, of, a, of a semi, an entire truck. And you know, it was something similar to what you see in that picture to the right. There was lots and lots of radio equipment, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, and they actually had a second truck that was just the power plant, the, the generators the, and backup batteries and things like that to keep it running. Um, it was supposed to be mobile, but it turned out when they first deployed it and set it up, it took so long and it was so sensitive because it was radios and antennas, they found out that they really couldn't move it. So they wanted to try, they were involved in a process of modernizing and they wanted to make it truly mobile. And uh, they were of course using this uh, one-time pad with the Vision Air Square. And as a, as a sidelight, when I was working with them, um, I, ha I did not, I was not familiar and I wasn't practiced at doing the one-time pad algorithm. So I had just been through the crypto classes learning about cipher wheels and I thought, gee, there ought to be a way to make a cipher wheel that does the vision air, screen, uh, vision air square. So I came up and that is this with a prototype of what I called the vision air wheel. And I just did it for myself just to go out and as I was working with them, uh, you know, have a little bit of an aid. Because it turns out that the vision air square, and I, should I really should have a picture of the back of this. This is an actual page that was the first page of a one-time pad that is the vision air square. But on the back, it has a list of all the unique three-letter combinations that the vision air square produces. There's like 123 of them. The Special Forces guys would memorize these so they could do the encryption and decryption in their head. I was a lot slower, so I came up with the wheel. First one I made was with graph paper, and I used rubber cement. Does anybody remember rubber cement? I haven't seen it in probably 15 years. Glued it to some cardboard, cut it out, stuck it together, took it to wherever I was going, and I was working with this you know, group of communications officers, and I turned my back on them, turned around, and they'd stolen it from me. And um, I made a few more the next time I went out, and they kept stealing them from me. So finally I said, would you like these things? And they're like, yeah, these things are really cool. So this is a prototype. We made like 15,000 of them and shipped them out to Special Forces. To this day, whenever I run into somebody that's ex-Special Forces, I ask them if they remember this thing. Somebody told me years ago that they, 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 they certainly remembered it, and they call it the whiz wheel or the whizzy wheel. So I usually say, hey, do you remember a whizzy wheel? And they're like, yeah, I remember that. And I said, oh, I'm the guy that invented it. And usually then they buy me a drink. <laughs> and then we talk war stories and, and all sorts of special forces type stuff, which is kind of fun. So anyway, that's something that I did early on in my career. There's the prototype here. You're welcome to take a look at it afterwards. Uh, but don't be like the special forces and try to walk away with it. Anyway, um, I was competing apparently, and I didn't know this for about a year, with literally the, the office right next to me. They were trying to do... Uh, a, a machine version of, of, and this was called a KL-43. Um, the little bar that you can sort of see in the middle, it's like a little LED screen and you would, you would type in characters and they'd pop up with the little red LED lights across the screen and maybe, gosh, maybe it was 30 characters wide, but it was, it was designed to do encryption but you had to type the message in and then hit enter and it would do the encryption automatically and send it off. And then in the reverse, it would come back and it would automatically do the decryption and you could read it across the screen. What I was working on was taking, instead of one-time tape, you guessed it, we put the key on a, a floppy disk and put most of that operation into a series of uh, laptop computers that uh, took a two, basically two 
semi trucks worth of gear and reduced it to how many, I think there's 17 transit cases. Those cases are about two foot by two foot square. That reduced the whole base station to that, primarily because they started using computerized technologies, laptops, and they replaced the recording equipment that had the one-time tape with a floppy disk. So it was, didn't seem like a big deal to me, but it was revolutionary and, and, and as far as I know, they used it for a while. So that was the first chapter in my life at NSA. Uh, after a couple years in that office, I moved on to become a, what was called a cryptanalysis intern. NSA had intern programs where you could get accelerated learning and training and diversity. And, and it was, a, it was, it was kind of similar to the, like the, you know, uh, the CISSP, you kind of have to have it to advance. You know, it's one of those thresholds that you don't get beyond unless you do this compulsory thing. So I ended up being an intern. So I went over to the other side of the house, the operations side, which is mo most people are familiar with. And I happened to be there during this little skirmish in, in the desert that they called the first Gulf War. So I, I was there during that time, uh, which was kind of cool because it was, it was, you know, I was a young kid and naive and I thought war was a thing of the past. And, you know, all the stuff that NSA did kind of went into production and we were doing it for real at that time. And we actually did a really good job of it. Um, shortly after that, uh, and, and if you, you can find this uh, article on Wired, I think it came out in 2013. Um, it says, uh, you know, there was a group of uh, cryptanalysis interns, hmm, where have you heard that before? Went on a field trip to CIA, found this statue in the courtyard. Has anybody heard of or seen this statue, the crypto statue? And, uh, uh, you know, fast forward, I was one of those interns. That's a, a copy of a printout of the, uh, the content of the statue, which is the crypto. That's just a portion of it. But you can see the date stamp there. It's September 1991. Um, but we were kind of mad that, and, this, and it's all captured in this Wired article. It's actually very accurate. Um, we were kind of mad that this statue was at CIA because we were NSA. We're the crippies. What's CIA got to do with it? So we took it upon ourselves to try to break the thing. Well, this article uh, came out a few months after another article that said some guy at CIA had solved the, the puzzle, um, you know, like in, in the late 90s or something like that, and, you know, before anybody else had. And then this follow-up article came out and said, oh, we found out that NSA solved it years before C the, the guy from CIA ever did. So interesting reading if you want to find it online. But uh, I was one of those interns. I was one of the people that was kind of offended. And we were like finding scraps of paper and pencil. And everybody took a quadrant and wrote the stuff down. And we took it back. And um, if you're interested, there's four messages in the statue. Three of the messages have been solved. The fourth one has never been solved. And what was described to us was it, it's in a courtyard where there's different statuary and symbol, symbols. And the, the, there's supposed to be this whole big overarching message of the whole courtyard. The whole thing was designed by this artist that thought it would be cool to put this secret code in. And he's given a couple clues. I think he just put out another clue in, within the last couple months because he's getting older and he ca would kind of like to see it solved before he dies, I guess. So if you're interested, it's still out there. The fourth, the, fourth, uh, the fourth message has yet to be solved. To my knowledge, nobody has solved, solved it. Part of the problem is it's so short. You know, all the frequency analysis and stuff is only so good. Uh, and, it's, and it works better the more data you have, obviously. So take a stab at it. Um, one of the things I had to do was write a, a paper doing a cryptographic attack. I actually tried to look at the Park Hill and come up with, you know, is it still secure even after all these years of use? So I had to do a technical paper that wrote, a, wrote about my analysis of the Park Hill. Um, and I became certified as a cryptanalyst. It's my one industry certification, if, if you will, that I hold to this day. Um, my last tour uh, was actually back on the InfoSec side of the house in an office called Fielded Systems Evaluations, where we were looking at s systems that we produce because it turns out the way the NSA does a lot of what it does is relies on people and see if this sounds familiar and applies to the modern world. Uh, people not changing default settings, people finding shortcuts, people not following the instructions, following workarounds, uh, basic, you know, one-time key being used for a week or a month, you know, just basically not following the directions. User error. Um, 
you know, we decide, somebody decided, gee, if we do that to them, how do we know they're not doing it to us? We produce these great systems, but how do we know our people that, you know, radio operators in the military tend to be 18, 19 years old, and they're trying to get the message across and trying to get their job done. And, you know, lo and behold, people find shortcuts and workarounds. People don't follow the instructions. Um, so we had a whole office that evaluated how our systems were used in the field. And I was there about the time this whole internet thing was happening and the World Wide Web, the first browser came out. And so uh, we had a division called Network Systems that very quickly became focused on the internet. Um, so they formed what was called uh, the Systems and Network Attack Center. I became a part of that. We were, we were supposed to be a worldwide center of excellence, smarter than everybody else, have more resources than everybody else, and was going to find all the vulnerabilities out there before anybody else and so on and so forth. Got into penetration testing, uh, vulnerability assessment, red teaming, and uh, we actually wrote a paper, a group of us, uh, that basically was a paper talking about how to break into our own network, and we got an award for it, uh, but we had to split it four ways, so it wasn't much. Has anybody heard of this book? came out earlier this year, Dark Territory. There's a chapter four titled Eligible Receiver. One of my buddies, uh, Sent a, sent a picture of this uh, a couple months ago when he was reading the book. There's a section in there. Um, I can read it to you. I'll let you read it. But you know, blah blah blah. NSA had a red team. Worked up at Fanex, and they did their most sensitive work in the pit. This is the Fanex complex up near BWI Airport. The pit was right there. I was part of the pit. The pit was my office. The guys that wrote that paper, we worked in this office called the pit. How it turned into this legend of the very super secret chamber, I don't know, but I'll live with it. It makes us famous for a few minutes. But more on that later. Uh, that we're talking crypto, not pen testing today. So I might have a talk on that uh, next year. So how does this all apply to modern cryptography? Um, you know, I, I'm still interested in crypto because crypto has certainly changed in terms of computers. Uh, uh, you know, obviously there's crypto in the internet. Uh, you know, certainly web traffic is probably the most common thing. VPN traffic, private connections. Um, you know, I used to have fun be, uh, in the early days trying to crack passwords because there was a lot of people that tried to make their own random password generators that never were and uh, they thought that they were really cool ways of producing really good passwords. They never were. Um, crypto is really hard to do and hard to do it well. Um, you know, the application of cryptography today, hashing functions, obviously, passwords, file integrity, um, web traffic, and so on and so forth. And this new thing that came along, public key cryptography, which has really enabled the web to do what it, what it does. Um, symmetric key is really like a one-time pad. You, you only do it in one direction. And um, in theory, both sides have the same key. So the key that's used to encrypt is also the key that's used to decrypt. And the big difference then with asymmetric cryptography, not getting into all the science and math about it, but the big thing is you've got two different sets of keys and they're, and they're one way only. So you have a public key that everybody can have access to that does the encryption that can only be decrypted by the secret side. And in fact, this is how special forces use their one-time pads. They, they carried two sets of one-time pads and they used them in one direction only. So they essentially did public key cryptography with one-time pads. They just didn't call it that back then. Um, there's, there's exceptions to this, but for the most part, the way modern cryptogra cryptographic systems are broken is by brute forcing. You're figuring out how many different combinations there are, figuring out shortcuts, figuring out ways to try all possibilities, and, the, and relying on the probability of uh, it doesn't take all the tries to get there, that statistically you're going to get the right guess at some point while you're trying them all. So it, it's very math heavy. Um, but there's other ways to break modern crypto, and that's attack the endpoints. So sooner or later, the, the message, the data, the traffic has got to be uh, decrypted. So you could try that in, or it's got to be encrypted in the first place. There's, there's a before and an after, and those are, those are attack targets. So don't even touch the crypto. Just try to get to the data on either end. Or find out a way to steal the keys. Um, 
So it's all about the keys. Uh, modern cryptography relies very much on key management, key distribution schemes, the keys having to be big enough that they can't be broken in a reasonable amount of time, and so on and so forth. <sighs> Pause. That's my real rough how it all ties on today. Any questions, comments? Yes? These days, a lot. And, and I'm not a math person. I used to work with math people. And I can sort of understand what they're saying, but it, it got, you know, I, like do, I still like doing the puzzles in the paper. But I, I'd say math is essential these days. Any other questions? Yes? <laughs> I've given this talk twice, and I had that question the first time. No, I can't. Um, well, the other question was phrased differently as what algorithm was used, and it wasn't. It, there, it was not machine-generated, man-made algorithm, any type of math that created the random in those one-time paths. And I can't tell you, honestly, how they did it. I mean, I know how they did it. I can't tell you how they did it, or they might come after me. Um, but it's not machine generated, which is a big difference in a lot of modern computer cryptographic systems that rely on a generated algorithm, algorithmically based, which is why math becomes important, algorithms. Because if you can duplicate it, if you can recreate it, if you can predict what the key is, and any man-made key essentially, uh, if it's being created, it can be recreated if you can figure out how to do it or steal the, steal the algorithm, that type of thing. Which is interesting because um, when we were building crypto systems and, and even devices back in the day, our basic assumption was the adversary knows everything about the system. They've gotten a hold of a copy of the system, whether it's hardware or software. They've reverse engineered it. They've got the schematics, the designs. They know everything about the system. And we still have to make sure it's secure. The way you do that is you protect the key. And you make sure that the key cannot be gained, you know, not be stolen. It's got to be protected in distribution. It can't be tampered with the device. It can't be stolen electronically, technically. Protect the key. It's still a secure system. Whereas these days, when you've got companies that are producing cryptographic systems, they very much rely on, well, it's proprietary. We're not going to tell you how we're doing it. Uh, you know, it's a secret. Uh, it's a real different mindset in the commercial world these days, and it drives an old timer like me crazy because I'm like, I want to know exactly how you've done it. So there's a lot of cryptographic systems that are out there, especially in the, in the PCI world, in the payment space. And, and I have yet to see a company that's producing any of those systems, I won't name names, that are upfront with, yeah, this is how we're doing it. And we've had it tested and we've had it verified by a third party and they've looked at our math and they've done all the testing and they say, yeah, it's good. As far as I'm concerned, it's not good until, it may be the best thing around, but until they have some sort of, in, what we used to call it, independent verification and validation. Have somebody look at it and put you through the paces and test it and see, yeah, you're good. That's, I, that's not done a lot today. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, not a whole lot, because I, I was in the paper shop, the manual shop. And I, most of what I knew about from the machine systems and the voice systems was either I used them, or like I was the custodian and had to send the key out for the stuff occasionally. But I, I, no, I didn't do a whole lot with that. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, so historically, uh, it, it all used to be what we called the offense, the operation side of the house, trying to break crypto and mess steal messages and communications of our adversaries. Um, when I was there, there was this defensive side that was, that was I think, maybe 10 or 20 percent of the mission in terms of budget and people and things like that. So it was always kind of a, an afterthought, and we, we always had this collective feeling of being the forgotten, you know, bastard stepchild. Everybody focused, all the money and everything went to the operations, the offensive side. Um, 
what's happened to uh, fast forward is I, I went to a, uh, a happy hour a couple months ago. They, they have basically dissolved what it was the defensive side of the house because of, of you know, the changing climate, the ch you know, everything going to the internet and, and networking um, and everything going cyber. So they have now a cyber command, but the mission is sort of blended into one so that they finally just dis dissolved what was the de defensive side, the infosec. So we went to a happy hour to just kind of toast the death of our, where we all used to work. And um, so officially it's back to one mission now. So was it political over the years? Always, there was always budget battles and things like that. There was a question up here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Subject for another talk, maybe. <laughs> key management talk. So my favorite. So, uh, um, frankly, I, I I would start with the history, you know, because most of the principles, uh, like, if if you've had to do the CISSP exam and have to read the chapters on the do, deal with cryptography, they talk a lot about key management, and they've got a lot of classical terminology and phrases and methods, and, and pretty much they're all taken from what used to be done as a manual method and applying the principles into the electronic world. So it might be oversimplistic, and maybe it's because I'm a curmudgeon, but starting with the foundation of where we've come from and, and what, what are the principles of separation, the pr principles of split key, split knowledge, dual control, all those types of things, and then extending it into the electronic world. How do you do that electronically and do it well? I, I think that's a good place to start. I have no idea how we're doing on time. So you, you guys will throw something at me or hit the sticks. More questions? What? We're good? Yes, sir. Of NIST? So that other talk that I haven't given, that I just gave you a teaser for, I could talk more about NIST. NIST historically, at least when I was there 20 years ago, uh, was responsible for uh, the unclassified world. And, and obviously they put out the standards and, and things like that. Um, but you know, there were some pretty clear lines of separation back in those days of the classified networks, the classified world, and the unclassified world within the government, within the DOD, civil agencies, and so on and so forth. So NIST had the purview for the unclassified world. And in theory, they did what we did. Um, and to say more than that, I'd probably piss people off from NIST. And I'm sure it's evolved. But they've, you know, today they are sort of the standards body uh, and, you know, the industry follows them or, or doesn't, depending on who you talk to. Um, it's not a good answer probably, but it's a whole other talk. Time's up? Okay. Thank you all very much. And again, and I'll bring this stuff to the back maybe.